I don't look at rejection as negative narrative. I use it to fuel my fire. Boom, right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Cold Joe Lomi podcast. Um, today, uh, I always say it's a special, special um, guest, but to be honest with you, this one I've been, I've been looking forward to just for the fact that someone that's come from the same sort of environment as myself um, has been at the highest level, um, achieved great things, um, also had these, had these moments as well, which, which we all go through ourselves. But this is something that I, I wanted to get on, um, on record and, and kind of get it out there, especially for the, the people that's been around me as well in terms of where I grew, where I grew up. Um, and I'm sure we're going to get a lot of gems today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Marlon King. Thanks, Marlon. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, no worries. Anytime, man. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm an open book, so fire away with your expertise and yeah. <laughs> you just take it from there, bro. No, I appreciate it. I appreciate it, man. But first of all, I hope everything's good on your side um, over there, especially with the family, especially during this time. So I hope everything's good on, on, on your ends of things, man. Um, yeah, no, same, same, bro. Same, same. Just We just want everybody to be safe and, yeah. and come through this pandemic because yeah. nobody saw it coming. So yeah. you just got to adjust and, and get on with it, you know? For sure, for sure. And that's that's something, obviously, as well, like people like ourselves, like coming up from, obviously, I grew up in Hackney, um, South London, man, like yourself as well, similar similar environments. We've always been able to adjust and had to adapt to things. So, but I wanted to start off with you because I'm a firm believer of our upbringing has, has a lot to do with, in terms of the way we, we, the way we maneuver um, throughout life and things like that obviously we can unlearn a few things but I feel like our childhood has a has a has a big stamp on what we do so you know I just want to touch on yourself like in terms of where you grew up your child how was that like in terms of your household um, just everything like that man um yeah well basically um you know I'm from South London Peckham born mm. and raised I grew up on the Camden, the Camden and North Peckham estate. Um, and, you know, I just, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to my upbringing, like yourself, mm. came up um, without the social media. And yeah. I'm sounding a bit old here, <laughs> but, um, you know, when I tell my kids that they still don't believe me, but um, yeah, we didn't have the social media. So you basically yeah. had to kind of like make your way and just adjust to your environment and my environment was like a concrete jungle basically but it was at that time it was a it was a it was a happy sad it was a mixture of emotions kind of environment because mm. you get good days you get bad days like now but it was more you kind of had to fend for yourself really really quickly we didn't have outlets we didn't have like people to speak to in terms of what we was going through as children, you had to like kind of buckle up and get on with it because if you showed too many emotions, it was seen as weakness when I was mm -hmm. growing up. For sure. You know, it was like, no, you got to dust yourself off. What are you talking about? Even mm -hmm. if you, you know, you, you see a lot of people coming out with different scenarios, whether they're, 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 they're gay or whether they've got like mental issues. A lot of it's been touched on now, mm -hmm. but back then, to, to, you couldn't to, speak to be able on that. to come out with that stuff. Mm. You couldn't speak on it. So we, we bottled a lot of stuff up as as youth. Um and we took it onto our adulthood, which is mm. unfortunate, but you know, it's just what it was when we was mm. growing up, you know? Mm. No, for sure, for sure. And and for those that that don't know yet, yeah, just explain to them, try and paint paint a picture for them. What was South London like at that time? Because now people are seeing Brixton is it's different, do you know what I mean? And and things are changing, even <laughs> in Hackney, like uh, Mare Street yeah. and, and, and Dalston, people are looking at it. When I'm going back there, people are like, yeah, I'm going to party in Dalston. Back in the days, you ain't going yeah. to Dalston to be partying, do you know what I mean? So just yeah. for the listeners that don't know about South, South London and Peckham and, and them sort of areas, like paint a picture for them. What was it like during those days? All right, well, basically, um, it was just, it was like, imagine say five miles that uh, might be exaggerating a bit three miles like of a, a road or motorway 
full of estates where you didn't actually have to go on the main motorway mm. to get to your destination. You had to navigate through different kind of corridors and every section, every estate had gangs. Mm. So you really knew, you really had to know how to protect yourself and how to adjust when to go, when not to go, when the street lights were coming and when they were going off. It was just a concrete jungle. You were living in the jungle, but just surrounded by concrete. That's what it was like. And it was, um, mm. it was, it was a situation where it gave us that street wise mentality. You know, you look back now and you think, I'm kind of glad I came from there because mm. if you wasn't good at school academically, you knew how to dip into something else, yeah. whether you, it was a hustle or what, whatever it was, you knew how to get by and, you, and you, it kind of gave you extra skin. Mm-hmm. But it was, you know, it was, it was it was different. Like you're not seeing any Costa coffees. It was <laughs> yeah, news not. agents, betting shop, Chinese yeah. shop, Indian takeaway, um, Caribbean the shops. laundrette, Caribbean shop. The mm-hmm. laundrette, the laundrette was a big one because not everybody had washing machines, so you had to go there and put your stuff in a big hot hot tumble dryer. <laughs> um, and wait for it to be done, fold it up, put it back in the bags and and, and go home. And on the estate, everybody knew each other. So it was kind of like a community vibe. But at the same time, we didn't have mobile phones. So if your mum and dad weren't in, you just either had to wait on the doorstep or you had to go to somebody's house to kind of fill that time until they came home. Yeah, yeah. So if they didn't leave you a key under the mat or... Am I sounding old right now? No, do you know what? Do you know what? I had to go through this myself as well. There there would be times, even like you're saying now, in terms of like mobile phones, if you've had a meeting like booked with your boys or whatever, you had to be there. Otherwise, if you're not there at that time, you're getting left. left. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, no, you know, no, go ahead, bro. Go ahead, man. Yeah, so so basically we didn't have the access to we didn't have the access to the access. Mm-hmm. Basically, we didn't have access to, to, to reach out to someone and say, no, I'm just around the corner or I send someone a text or WhatsApp mm-hmm. or, or on, on Instagram. We didn't have that. It was basically, and if you didn't have the 10 pence to make the phone call, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. When, and when you had the mobile phones with the voicemail, yeah. that was the worst because as soon as you put your money in the machine, gone. You leave, it's gone. Yeah, yeah. So there's yeah. no phone call. Yeah, people yeah. didn't know about voicemail then, so they weren't really listening to what people were mm. saying on the phone, and it was too late then. So yeah, yeah. You just had to adjust. You know that way of growing up. You just had to adjust, which was a mm. pro and was a con at the same time. Because if you look back now on the states that we grew up, yeah, so many predators, so many violent acts going on. Yeah. Um, you know, you see, we talk about social services now and people's um, equal opportunities. Mm. Those things were not accessible to us. Mm. We saw a lot of stuff that if it was all spread out now on the news and social media, I don't think, I think most kids will be in care. Yeah, or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, for sure, the, for sure. The way I grew up, it was kind of like, it gave me a tough skin and I, I never used that as a negative narrative to kind of um, beat up myself. But mm. I did bottle up a lot of stuff because I didn't, I didn't know how to express mm. what I was going through because we didn't get taught, can I say, life skills. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for Do sure. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Say now you're in the corporate world, I go into the professional world. Mm. I didn't know how to make the adjustments because nobody sat me down and said, look, you're not on the streets anymore. You're mm-hmm. not in a hood anymore. You now have to know when to switch it off. Mm-hmm. So I never got that. So mm-hmm. That's what I say to the youngsters all the time. No, for sure. I think, do you know what it is, bro, as well? Like, I feel like a lot of those things, like he said, in terms of things happening. I remember when I was 15 and the first time that, Obviously, you'd hear about stabbings and you'd hear about killings and things like that. But when I was 15, to actually find out that my own boy has been killed, like, that was a first. And it's like, you, like you said, you get immune to the, to what's happening around you. And then, obviously, you hear people going to jail and things like that, getting 30s, getting lives. And it's like, you kind of just get, it becomes your norm. 
Do you know what I mean? It becomes your yeah. norm. And yeah. it's like, like you said, you're not allowed to open up and, 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 and just speak your, speak your feelings. Do you know what I mean? Because again, one, it could be seen as being weak, especially as a man in the hood. You can't speak your feelings. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So that was happening. And yeah. it's like, like you said, you bottle up a lot of this emotion. So when you get older, sometimes a lot of this frustration that comes out, you're thinking, why did I do that? But there's a lot of frustration within you from, that's been built up from time ago. Do you know what I mean? And it's yeah. like, once you release yeah. it, people are like, where did that come from? But you don't know what yeah. I've seen. Do you know what I mean? You don't know what I've seen. You yeah. don't know what yeah. I've gone through. Yeah. Do you know what yeah. I mean? So it's like, a, a lot of those things, have, like I said, I'm a firm believer of, you know, being open about, you know, your journey when, when you was younger and things like that, because I feel like that opens up a lot of, uh, it opens up a conversation because of, you know, certain things that you do now. So, and in terms of outlet as well, do you feel like football was your outlet? That was my only outlet. Um, Speak about it. No that, one right? sat me down at home. Mm. Yeah, no, no, no one sat down at, uh, listen, I, listen, I came from, I don't, I, I'm not going to bash my parents, but I came from mm. a broken home and, you know, we, 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 we go through stuff as, even as adults now, we think that the kids don't understand what's going on. I, mm. I remember stuff vividly now as a 40 year old, you know, like I, mm. and I understand it was part of my journey and it was part of my emotions and part of the, my makeup. But um, in terms of what you just touched on in, in, in saying that we didn't know how to open out and talk about things. And it's kind of like self healing because mm. what we do we build up stuff and we have this hard exterior. I know I talk to my wife about it. She says to me, you know, you've got to stop having this hard exterior, but yeah. I'm a product of my environment. So mm -hmm. I'm used to people trying to target me for the wrong things or mm -hmm. me feeling a certain way just because of how um, I grew up. And I'm, I'm still, even now, I'm still trying to make the adjustment of how to let go of certain stuff because mm. what it's doing, it's, it's it affecting my path mo moving forward. I still yeah. feel like I'm this guy. And my, like my wife, her mum and dad are still together to this day. She grew up in a very, very comfortable, happy household. It's totally mm. different from me. And that's what gives me my balance. But I'm still trying to learn how to let my guard down totally yeah. because where I'm from you don't do that you let your yeah you you can't you can't yeah and I'm seeing more and more people talk about mental health and I think it's a beautiful thing because that is like self-counseling when people mm. can open out and talk but they have a platform to reach out to we didn't have anything no all I had was a football and that was my counseling that was my outlet when I saw my mum and dad fight or I saw Things happening at home. My sister leave home when I was younger. I moved out when I was like 14 out of my house. Going football, as soon as I stepped onto that court or the pitch, that mm. was my outlet. That was like, I forgot about everything for that yeah. hour or two. Yeah. So any given opportunity, I was playing football. Maybe I love football, but that wasn't the only reason I was doing it. I was mm. looking for something else to take me away from the world. I was no, going to ask so. you that. I was going to ask you that. I was going to say to you deeply, do you feel like as well, my, even myself, like, do you feel playing football? Do you feel like, obviously, because growing up in, in the hood, that's football is the number one sport. Do you know what I mean? It's number one sport in the world. But yeah. if you're a baller, you're accepted in, in a lot of places in the hood. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, do you feel yeah. deep down football was your true passion or was it like your, your escapism? It was a, it was a bit of both. It was my because I at that point when I was younger, I wanted to do everything, mm. whether it was table tennis, whether it was rounders, yeah. whether it was knockdown down ninja, mm. and and if you got parents that are saying go out and play, no, no one. As I said, and I'll go back to it. Nobody's sitting down and go, I want to see what your grades are. Yeah, like go back, go out and play. You get home, change your uniform, mm. you go out and play, come in when the street lights cut off yeah. or whatever. That's what I was told. Mm -hmm. So when if I did stay in too long, I saw what was going on that I shouldn't have saw what was going on. Mm. So sometimes even my parents use that as a tool. Now go out and play. Yeah. And we do it as adults now. Go to your room, go on the computer, just yeah. so 
the parents can hash it out without mm -hmm. going into too much detail. Mm -hmm. They're using their kids to say, oh, go, go and play, go and do this to whatever shenanigans they want to get up to. Mm -hmm. So for me, I knew that as that was kind of like a trigger to say, okay, there's a problem here. So let me go out and play. Let me go and create a game, whether mm -hmm. it be marbles on the yeah. brain or whatever it was. That was my outlet. Football happened to be kind of drilled into me and something that I latched onto. Mm -hmm. out of all. But I was burning myself out, bro. I was doing everything. I was playing tables. Anything that was... I just wanted to be number one. Whether it was a race, yeah. sprints, we were there. It was knockdown down. I was there. Because mm -hmm. I knew in the back of my mind, going home wasn't a positive outlet for me. I didn't mm -hmm. look forward. I didn't. I didn't look forward to going home. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I found any sort of kind of access to something else to take my mind away from kind of the crap that was going yeah. on in my house. Mm. Yeah, no, that's powerful, man. And and another thing as well, yeah, I think I heard it somewhere, but like when when the soldiers go to war or anything like that, and they come back, they get help, they get therapy. You know what I mean? They get that mental help, whereas. In the hood, we're basically at war with each other 24 7. And it's like when things happen, again, it just becomes that normal. So it's like you have to adjust and you got to have these outlets where it's ball or you might get taken to the wrong crowd and you do something else, which nine times out of 10 is very likely to happen. Do you know what I mean? Unless you've got a strong background and, you know, you've got that support mechanism. But did you ever feel like with football you was ever going to make it or it was just a, just a hobby for you at that time? I, I, I think, no, nah, I, I think from when I started to love it, I made it a mission of mine to get to what I saw was the pinnacle. Mm -hmm. And that was becoming a pro. That word becoming a pro, I became obsessed with that word. I started manifesting it. I started, I started slowly sacrificing where I was from because then I saw as my journey went on I saw my friends doing the stuff that normal kids do mm. and I there was a difference between my mental capacity and theirs because they were really good at football a lot of them better than me but they didn't know how to they didn't tap in to what it is that they wanted to do and this is what I say to youngsters when you have a passion you have a goal and I, I really enjoyed football. I enjoyed it. It was my buzz. It was not just my outlet. It was a buzz for me, especially scoring goals. Mm. And then I started to attach myself with becoming a professional. And once I'd done that, and I triggered my brain into, I want pro, pro, no matter what level, pro, it was semi-pro or pro. I didn't have a plan B. I'll be honest with you. I didn't have a plan B. It was just, I want to become a pro. Mm. I didn't even think about what club I was going to play for, even though I supported Arsenal and everything. That wasn't a conversation. I just wanted to become a pro and became obsessed with it. And then I just started to sacrifice and then separate myself. While those guys were jogging, they'll come home six o'clock in the morning from raves and clubs. Mm. I was running around Peckham Rye Park and they all just bib me, they all mm. drunk, girls and whatever. And I was running around either with my dog or I had my football and I was just pinging balls to myself. I'll ping a ball and then run, sprint after, get it. I was just, I became obsessed with what 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 I managed to kind of su succeed in, you know? Mm -hmm. And also, like, also in terms of the, the word that you use, manifest, is, like, who who at that time was you looking at that's come out of the area that kind of you looked at was like, you know what, he's made it, so if he's made it, I can do it as well. Was there anyone? Of course, there was a lot of ballers that come out of South London, but around your generation, who was the guy for you to say, you know what, he's done it, so I'm going to go and do it as well? I think for me, I had guys around me, like my cousin, like we're like brothers. He was at West Ham, mm -hmm. left footed. He got a YTS. It was him, Terrell Forbes. Um, there was quite a few guys that were around me and I didn't, I, I started off, I went to Millwall and Millwall kind of had their favours at the time. They were in what the first division, what you call the premiership. And I kind of, Went to Red Lion Training Ground in Bermondsey, tore it up, but I didn't get selected for YTS. Broke my heart, but it didn't stop me. And mm. then 
was kind of like I took the next route and then obviously started at Dulwich Hamlet. And I was like 15. And I was, but I was still working because that's one thing I would say about my dad that he gave me, he gave me that work ethic to say, regardless, you've got to have that work ethic. Hmm. So I was, I was, I was working for Domino's Pizza. Okay. I was like 15, riding a moped hmm. in the snow, black ice, three pound an hour, um, through Catford, peck, everywhere. I was, and I was still pursuing my dream because I became mm. obsessed with what it is I wanted to do but I had like people like Ian Wright living across when I moved because I had my my mum was well my mum and dad was from Peckham but then when they broke up my dad shifted to Broccoli so then okay. I was in between the two so I had Peckham boys who I've got mm. family members in which is a gang yeah, and then I had which is YPB and then I had the Ghetto boys and you mm. had YGB yeah, I had family members in the in, in both. This is how bonkers it was, and it was like when I went to see my mum, I had to come across paths of these gang members of the Peckham boys, and then when I was going to my dad's, I was around ghetto boys, and I had fam. So I had to kind of avoid all of that and stick to what I loved Stay and, and football carried through. Yeah, because even. You know, even like my younger brother just finished the 12 year. He got an IPP, which is, I don't know if people yeah. know an IPP sentence. It's like a life sentence and you don't get a date. He just, he got, his mum, she got a different mum for me, moved to Brixton. So he got involved in the 28s and, you know, he, he went, he, I'm sure he done. Yeah, he, like robbing drug dealers, guns and stuff. So he's come out now and I've managed to kind of, talk to him and mentor him and now he's set up his own clothing label mm. so he's journey and I'd, I'd love you to do a bit with him as well because yeah, his yeah. journey is powerful as well but I was stuck in all of that and what got me away from maybe being either dead or doing a long term jail sentence was, was football mm -hmm. and I just focused on it and everybody kind of respected me and I never really found myself in problems not just because I had family members on both but they saw that my mindset wasn't in, I wasn't mm. on no BS. I was just, mm. it was just the ball. Mm. That, that mm. was it. And then they respected me for that. So I had Ian Wright living in Broccoli, like literally two seconds away from me where we know each other. And he was my, he was kind of like my idol. He was playing for the team that I, I, I loved. Mm -hmm. And then he came up late in the game. You know, I still speak to him to this day and it's kind of like he kind of... Then you had Rio in Peckham mm. and Anton, who I still get on to this day with. So I had little spurts of inspiration, but it, I wouldn't say that was like the defining factor of me playing professional football. It was just that the, the, it was a feeling of scoring goals. I just mm. loved it and I thought, I just want to become pro now. I just want to... Yeah. I didn't even think about the money or nothing. I just that word coming a pro. That was that was it. Mm. But you don't though, really. You don't. When you when you're that age, like you say, you don't really think about the money. Like you said, you're doing it because of the passion. You're doing it for the love of it. But one thing that you said, I don't want to skip past it because it's very very important. Because I found myself in that circumstance as well before, and 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 a lot of these youngsters as well that I've been trying to help. Um, what you said was when people are coming back from raves. And they're seeing you jogging. Like, it's easy to say, you know what? I didn't get picked for Millwall at that time. So, you know what? When next time they're, they're driving around, you know what? I, I'm going to join them, you know, because I, I might not be good enough. Who knows? You know what I mean? And it's, and it's easy to go into that cycle and whatnot. Like, again, where, where did that mindset come from where you said, you know what? I know you said you just wanted to score goals. It was a passion for yourself. But it's easy, again, to go down that route. But for you, what what was the motivation? What was the drive for you to continue and say, you know what, just because I didn't get signed for Millwall doesn't mean I stay in. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep riding this wave until I do get that pro. Do you know what? I think I think for me, um, I don't look at rejection as 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 a negative narrative. I use it to to fuel my fire. Okay. When anybody and my wife will tell you and my parents will tell. You, and when somebody says I can't do something, mm. it it just triggers something in my head to say, okay, we'll see. Mm. So when 
I saw everybody doing everything and people were like, ah, no, you're just going to go rave and whatever. I'm like, and even sometimes I fall out with my parents. So they, they, ugh, you know, like, I'll be angry at them not coming to my games and watching my games. Yeah. And this time I just scored like, all five goals. They don't, mm-hmm. they don't understand the journey. I didn't look at it and say, I'm, I'm leaving how they feel about me there. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, so I'm going to take you to a space. This was my mindset. I'm going to take you to a space just to show you I'm not following what you're doing. Mm-hmm. I'm going to te- I'm going to te- I'm going to take you to a different space where you're going to go fair play. And mm-hmm. that was that was that was my drive. That was kind of like my mental capacity. I didn't I'm not a follower. I'm a leader. I don't like following or 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 I, look, like I respect a lot of people and they tell me stuff, but it's for you to take on what you want to take on. Yeah. Cuz my mindset is such a powerful thing. Yeah, so it, yeah. People don't understand that we only tap into a small percentage of what we're actually capable of. So I never left it at as, oh, well, I never made the excuse of, oh, well, my mum and dad never will come and watch me. Or, you know, all my mates are going party. That was, I used, I, I, I flipped the narrative. I was like, mm. you're doing that. I want to be different. Mm. You know, like none of, none of my family members, hardly any of my family members are married. I didn't want that. I didn't want the baby mama drama and all that. I've been with my wife 20 years. I didn't mm. want what everybody wants. I, d- I don't like being put in a box. I don't like to be put, I don't like to be typecast. I don't like to, e- even though I've made loads of errors, I don't like, I like to, to be able to test myself. And, and mm. I think that was what my drive was. Mm. Mm. That's powerful, man. One thing that, one thing that I want to cover as well in terms of like the support mechanism, like you said, you've been with your wife for, for, 20 years um i've heard you mention her a few times now and i can see well i'm speaking from experience as well like you know my missus as well like having someone that's there for you no matter what and giving you that support especially for these young ballers that's coming through in the game right now some of them are, are earning ridiculous money so they're gonna have women left right and center coming to them do you know what i mean now for you what advice would you give to any young baller right now that's going through that that sort of system that they, they're earning a lot of money? It's hard because obviously you've got to enjoy yourself. A lot of these young ballers, again, they just they didn't have it before. So when it's coming towards them, it's like it's hard to kind of deal with it. But again, for you and for even for myself, like having a strong woman behind you that supports you to help you build your empire, how important is it to have someone like that in your corner? Yeah, it's, it, it, it's massive, bro. And, I, and I'll say, like, you know, at times we take it for granted and yeah. certain things, there's certain things that you even said, yeah. <laughs> um, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, to have somebody who's behind you, not just when you're winning, but when you, you feel like you lose and you're in a, you're in a dark space is, is huge. Mm. And, you know, it, it's like anything, if you, if you eat and cook a food a certain way every single day, it just becomes part of your 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 your, your makeup and your DNA. But mm-hmm. it's not until it's kind of taken away from you or you're in a situation you're reminded how powerful that is. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'll say this to young I say this to youngsters all the time. When you get comfortable is when you slip up. Yeah. And you need to find, and I'm saying this at 40 years old now, you need to find a kind of positive situation that when you are comfortable, find a way to make yourself feel uncomfortable. Mm. And when I say that, because when I, when I say it, people are like what, do, like, what do you mean? I mean, if you can find an un- a uncomfortable way when you're comfortable, you find something that's uncomfortable. When, you, when you're uncomfortable, you're comfortable, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. But whatever you're going through, good, good times about, you know how to tap into that zone. Mm-hmm. So for me, when I, I, when I messed up in my career, when I went through my jail sentences, I felt like I had it made. I felt like this is it. 
You understand what I'm saying? It yeah, weren't yeah. until my back's against the wall. That's when I perform my best. So even when you get to the pinnacle, you see a lot of guys like they 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 make it. Like you look at uh, young um, Harry Maguire today in, in the news and stuff. And I know mm. H is my ex teammate and stuff. Great kid, England's Man United captain, and then just a the little thing can just yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, and yeah. you also need to know your team around you. You need to know your environment. That That's key. We do not, especially your field and anybody else who's doing really well, we don't focus on what's around us. We yeah. just look at what's happening to us. Mm. And nobody's there to teach us life skills. That's yeah. what's missing. Mm. Life skills. Because to get fame and fortune is so, it's overnight especially even with bloggers, whatever you are, whether you're doing a podcast, you yeah. can go from 1,000 followers to 1 million followers, you start earning all this money, but nobody sat you down and go, listen, this is going to change. Mm -hmm. you, you need to be switched on. And, and that's a big, big thing. And uh, this is what I'll say to these youngsters. When you feel like you're comfortable, you made it, you ain't. There's something else out there to keep you going, keep you on your toes um, and keep you switched on. So for me... I never look at the errors that I made as a loss. I look at them as a lesson. Mm. And it's not just for me, but for the next generation behind me, like my son, nephew, nieces, anybody else. And that's what I'm saying to you today. Like, I'm open field. I don't hide anything. A lot of footballers that will talk to you won't touch base on everything that's happened mm. because they're still trying to portray everything's okay, which sometimes is an Achilles heel. I, I think mm -hmm. no for sure bro and this is you know what this is this is another reason why I was like super excited to do this one because I could speak to you about your career you've had a you had an amazing career like at the end of the day you live the dream every boy's dream is to especially from where we come from is to make it at the highest level you've gone to the Premier League you've played against the best players in the world you've done all of that now for me I want to touch more so in terms of like the mindset and everything that you've gone through because, like you said, a lot of these players will portray that everything's all right. But at the, at the same time, which people don't realise, these footballers, they're human beings at the same time, just like everybody else. They've all got feelings. They all go through a lot of things. And like you said, someone like Maguire now, I don't know what the situation is, but there's been an altercation or whatever. And he's, and he's reacted allegedly. I don't know. But... We're humans. We're going to react sometimes, depending again on what we've been through. It might just not be our day or whatever. Do you know what I mean? It might be that, that ticking bomb where, do you know what? This is the day. That, it's not my day. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to react. Do you know what I mean? So for me, again, I want to touch on the moments like you've gone to the highest level. You played at the Prem. You've gone through whatever you've gone through now. Who was there? Because I know, I'm, I'm sure you had everyone around you that said, you know what, Marlon, you're the man, you're the guy. And then once certain things happened, who was there for you? Who was there? How many people was left that you could say that supported you during whatever you was going through? The, um, the people that I didn't kind of listen to. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Well, my, obviously my wife is, she's my ride or die. Yeah. But when they're telling me don't don't go out, don't, mm. and I've all I've come from a situation where I'm my own man. Mm -hmm. I moved out when I was fourteen, got my own place when I was sixteen. So I was never really one to kind of be told what to do. Yeah. Now, when you got other people, and 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 in that world, and I'm sure in, in people that are successful as well. It, life just moves so fast mm -hmm. you kind of put your blinkers on it's like well I've got this far and who is that person that's talking to me because yeah, yeah. look where I'm at yeah. do you understand and it's a negative kind of mindset to kind of look at that and I'll say the people that were there and that are still here are the, are the most kind of vocal ones that were muted mm. in my head mm -hmm. and the people that I was had the volume 
were the ones that weren't there. Mm. If that does that, I don't yeah, know yeah, if that yeah. makes, makes perfect make sense. sense. Make, make yeah. perfect sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The people that I should have listened to, I put them on mute, mm-hmm. and the people that I listened to had had the, the the loudest voices at that time. But then when I got into the the, the, the stuff that I got into, they became mute, mm. and then the ones that I should have listened to had the volume, but yeah. then it was too late. So, yeah. but for me, everything that happened, and, and I'm sure we'll touch on this later, became apparent and relevant into my next journey because life mm-hmm. is bigger than football. Life is bigger than being a podcast. It's all about yeah. being a human being. So it taught me lessons and I think it gave me, how can I put it, a head start in the profession that I was in because every time I got into trouble, mm-hmm. I had to, I was so close for it to, to it being not there, I was ready preparing for my career to be over, if okay. that made sense. Whereas okay. sometimes when it goes smooth, you get caught in this bubble yeah. and then when that burst, you, like everything comes at you and then people start to understand, oh no, I've got to pay my bills, oh no, I've got to pay my mortgage off. I was already doing that which mm-hmm. we'll, I'm sure we'll touch on later. Yeah, yeah. I was doing that from early because these things that happened to me, like, oh, I might not have football, so I've got to put that money away or I've got to knock out this mortgage or I've got, mm. I was already doing, me and my wife, and luckily enough, I found, like, my best mate, which is my wife, and we was on the same page from when she was 17 and I would just turned 20, so, and was all about building and we all... We all agreed that my career had a has a short window. And that's yeah, one yeah. thing I'd say to these young youngsters. Don't just put all your eggs in one basket. There's more we call it multiple sources of income. Don't be afraid to look anyway. Look, I'm I think I'm jumping. No, no, bro. So, keep keep going, man. Keep um, going. Keep going, bro. Um, yeah, so when I was getting in trouble, it was kind of like it was a pro and a con because it was a con. Obviously, I was letting my family down. I was, mm. but I was that I was that kind of guy that I thought I had this kind of self-destructive button, and I was like, I always reacted, and I always done better when things weren't going smoothly. Mm. If that made sense. It yeah, felt yeah, yeah. Like, It felt weird and unnatural for me for things to just be smooth. smooth. Everything's perfect. Yeah. It, it, yeah, I wasn't used yeah. to that. I didn't come from that, so. Mm. It took adjusting, and, and and that's why people look at me and think, oh, how did you go? Like, how did you get in trouble so many times? And it felt normal. It was almost like normal to me to get myself in trouble because I knew in my back of my head, I was like, well, I'm, watch, everybody thinks that's it. Oh, yeah. That's, I don't know, that was kind of like my kryptonite. That was like my fuel mm-hmm. to do better. It was, it was weird because I mm-hmm. came from a a destructive background. So for everything to go smooth for me wasn't normal. Yeah. So when I was, when my career, when I did hit the Premier League or when I did start, like the first time I really realised what was happening to me is when I got myself into trouble um, for, um, I started at, hold on one sec. The dog no worries, bro. Was, sorry, Pelly. Um, I, I went from kind of semi-pro, then I was at short spell at Barnet even at Barnet when I got my pro, I was I was working. Mm. I think I was on about three hundred fifty pound a week. I was only like 16, 16, 17. Wow! And I got myself a job in pre season. You know when everybody's resting and yeah. going. I got myself a job. I was working for some um, chauffeur company. It was like these, those little monkey bikes. You ride them. You pick up people that have had a few to drink. You fold yeah, up the yeah. bike, put the bike in the boot of their car, drop them home, unfold the bike. I was I was doing that because what made you do that though? Well, sorry to cut you off. What what made me do it? Because yeah, what I, made I, you just go and get a job at that time? Three fifty for a sixteen year old. That's that's pretty good, pretty good money. Do you know what I mean? Because I I, I listen. I was doing paper round when I was like nine ten. Okay. So I was, so you had that in you? Always, yeah. Even when I was at, yeah, even at school. I was like the first kid to have a BWS moped because I, okay. I used to buy the Loot newspaper. I don't know if people know about the Loot newspaper. <laughs> yeah. it was a, and 
I used to buy like computers, like a Neo Geo, I'll buy it for like 150 pounds and I'll flip it for 300 pounds, put the money, then buy myself a car. And I used to do that as a youngster. So I always had that kind of hustle mm -hmm. about me. So football, I never looked at football as a money thing for me until kind of later stages of my career. So even when I was playing football, I was like, this ain't enough, I need to work. Okay. So that was all, do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It was almost always like, and where I had rejections from like Millwall, I was playing for Dali Jamlet. It, it still didn't, I didn't know what was happening to me. It weren't until I got into a, 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 a bit of trouble and it came out in the paper and I was like, yeah. well, people really know about me. And this is when I went to, to Gillingham. And Gillingham bought me for like, I think it was like 300 grand when I was 19 from Barnet. And I was still going back to the ends. I was still, mm. going, I didn't know when to switch off. Yeah. I didn't know how to separate the two. I was still going back, hanging out with the wrong people and then going training in the morning. And on Saturday, I'm scoring goals because back then you like you had to go on teletext and wait for the, the, <laughs> the kind of... Your, yeah, you, you, brought it back. you brought it yeah. back. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. What was it, 308 or something like that, the football? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 401, yeah. whatever yeah. it was. Yeah, so yeah, I yeah. Didn't, I didn't know how to separate the two, bro, and it was... Yeah. So I got my... I was going back. You might get into a fight or get into a little madness or mm. doing something, and then it came out in the newspaper and it was like, oh, okay, wow, people... It wasn't even so much I got in trouble. It was like, oh, people know who I am. Like... Mm. You know, it's like, oh, no, the five million pound rated strike. And I was like, it was weird to me. I didn't mm -hmm. understand it because I didn't separate myself. And I didn't, I didn't know how to adjust from that side of things going mm -hmm. on to um, the next stage of my career. And it yeah. took me ages. And I just, you know, and I'll say to the youngsters, they need to know their circle and they need to know when to switch it off. Mm. And you'll see the difference between the players that have a career and the ones that get to the very, very top. Mm -hmm. Those little small bits of detail where you switch it off. If your mate's doing that, all right, he's over there. You, I'll see you maybe at a game or whatever. You switch it off. Yeah, yeah. You know, you have to be selfish to be successful. And I didn't, I didn't understand that. Mm -hmm. No matter what you do in life. And, and the word selfish is usually associated with like a negative narrative it's not sometimes you got to be selfish to be able to be kind meaning mm. if your brother needs help or whatever you're mm. gonna have to tell your bro nah not today i've got something to do to be mm. able to help him on the back end if that makes sense i don't know bro that made perfect sense and that's powerful as well like i feel like me personally just listen to that is it's so similar to a lot of myself even my peers like even like a good friend of mine, like now Ranger, who again he's gone through similar things that you've gone through as well. Like he's been at the, we was looking at him thinking, bro, you've made it. You you're at Newcastle. You're with Michael Owen and all these other players, and and for him to go through what he's gone through, it, it is a bit sad. But at the same time, again, it's like what you said is you got to understand to disconnect yourself from the people around you that were around you. And by the same time, do you feel like you going to Gillingham, do you feel like you had enough support from Gillingham where, again, going back, that was your normality. That's that's your comfort zone. That's the people that understand you. Like, they know Marlon. Like, they know me. Do you know what I mean? And at the same time, coming from where we come from, it's a thing where you got to do it together. you got to you got to come up together. Yes. Do you know what I mean? you got to... When we, once, if, if I make it, you're, everyone's coming with me. Do you know what I mean? That's the mentality that we've been brought up with, where certain other maybe cultures or, or different classes and whatnot, they're very driven, direct to the point. Do you know what I mean? We, we haven't been like that. It's like if one person makes it, you got to bring me. Otherwise, if you don't bring me, you're a funny guy. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, do you feel like, again, yeah. it, it's, it's that... Um, the life, it all comes down to the life skills, like you said. It all comes down to that, being, being educated in terms of, of, of um, yeah, understanding that, which is powerful, man. Um, and I feel like, again, in terms of 
where you got to the level that you got to, do you feel like you ever got complacent with what you had? Yeah, and every time I got in trouble, that's when I got yeah. comfortable. Okay. If you look at my career, and you look at things that I went through, sloppy, got sloppy, got comfortable, thought mm. this was it, um, switched off and got punished. Mm. There's no there, there's, there's no dressing it up. Um, I haven't talked to my kids about it. Um, and this is what I'm saying. I, 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 I try and turn a negative into a positive. And yeah. like me speaking to you and I speak to yeah. even my kids. I mean, they're the ones that kind of, my kids and, and, and my wife um, kind of convinced me to 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 get on Instagram and, and, yeah. and do all these interviews. Because they're like, you know what, Dad, um, you've got too much stories. You've got too much experience that can help um, someone behind you that might be in a feel like they're going in a similar kind of sim situation or help someone avoid um, throwing their career away. Because I was, mm. you know, I was lucky enough to have people to, to give me another chance and um, I always felt confident in my, in, in my, not just in my football career, but in terms of like my work ethic. Yeah. Like it's, it's it, it, my work ethic is crazy, crazy. I don't, and, and this is why I've never gone into coaching. I've never, and I've always said to my wife, like I've had job offers and stuff like that and yeah. scouts and stuff. And I said, you know what? My mindset is to to show people the world is bigger than football and bigger than whatever you feel like people putting you in a box to be. Like nobody's mm -hmm. gonna tell me because everybody's going, Oh, you, why don't you be a coach? I don't wanna be a coach. Not yeah. because I can't yeah. be a coach. Just I wanna try and challenge myself to something else. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've come over here to Zambia, I've set up my own construction company. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got real estate all over the place and it, it, it the the mindset is a powerful thing. People need to understand that's that's your biggest asset. It's your yeah. biggest investment. It, before you start or do anything, mm. you need to make sure that this is switched on and you're ready to take this, to, to, to listen to this and, and believe in it. Mm. And if you don't, you're hoping. And with hope, the percentages drop. Mm. With belief, the percentages is, is, is a lot higher. If you believe in something, you manifest something. And it was my wife that got me onto this manifestation thing. Okay. Um, and it's deep. It, yeah. it's, it, it's, it's deep, deep man. It's, it's deep. Just, and it is deep, like because I used to think, like you know, sometimes when I shoot a goal, sometimes I hope it might go in, and then yeah. maybe nine times at ten I'd miss. Whereas I have days where I, I know it's going in, like this ball. You almost like mentally push that ball in the back of the net, mm -hmm. and and that's what people don't understand. You need to work on your mind before. Whatever you're doing, whether you're a milkman, whatever you're doing, mm -hmm. you need to focus on your mindset. And once mm -hmm. you can focus on that and tap into this, you've won half the battle. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you want to get fit, what is the biggest thing that stops you from going to the gym or working as hard as you want or when you feel tired? It's this. Your mind. It's not even yeah. your body. Mm -hmm. Your mind. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a successful podcaster yeah. and... It, what is stopping you? Mm. Lose your excuses, find your results, man. And that mm. starts in here. So for me, I didn't realize that I was, I was my biggest asset. I was, you know, sometimes we wait for approval. Don't wait for mm. approval. Mm. And if you don't, if you don't want to, if you don't want to work for a boss and fulfill somebody else's dream, Start your own dream. Yeah. Invest yeah. in yourself. Invest in your own. You have to invest in yourself. Like I've even got my even my daughter. She started her own um, cosmetic care uh, okay. company. She's fifteen. Okay. Online. She's, I told her. I said, look, and it's not being arrogant. What I don't. It's not. I don't want to work for someone. But why are you going to work for someone when you can work for yourself? Mm -hmm. Especially these days. You know, we. You, you know what I'm saying, mm. bro? That we wasn't taught that we was always like a nine to five doctor, yeah. lawyer. Yeah. Fireman, plumber, electrician. Well, okay, if you want to be a plumber and electrician, start your own company. Mm -hmm. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Invest in yeah, yourself, yeah. take the yeah. risk. But we have this fear. And the word fear, it's it stops us from elevating to places that we really can get to. Mm. You know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. It, it keeps people... Have you not ever... I've seen so many people that have got so much talent, but they just don't believe in it. Right, go go to Hackney and go South London, and it's there all day long. 
It's you know what I mean? ev- worldwide. Yeah, worldwide. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, we have to, our, our minds are our biggest assets. Mm-hmm. Even I say to my wife all the time, like, you need to come at yourself sometimes. You need to challenge yourself. Yeah. Even she, you, you need to take to yourself. And this is what I said to you. When you're comfortable, make yourself yeah. uncomfortable because that's mm-hmm. when you get your best results. Mm-hmm. I'm telling mm-hmm. you. Yeah, you yeah. come outside your zone and you're like, all right, I'm going to dip my toe. I'm, just put your foot in, put, yeah. put, put your toes in the water, man. See, and then yeah, you, yeah. you end up, it's like getting into an ice bath. You like, yeah. you dip your toe in, you know, oh, <laughs> you have a leg and you're like, oh, you know yeah. what? If you just go, you know what, sure. Let me just, mm. just dip in. And then, yeah. you, and then, they, then you got the next person just still dipping their toe in. Oh, yeah. my car. <laughs> That, yeah. we, we're feeling the same thing for sure but it's this, but it's this what, what what the feeling mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. do you understand mm-hmm. what I'm saying it's yeah this. for sure bro it's crazy man that's why no, you see sure. certain people go further than others mm-hmm. because the mind is different not the yeah, body yeah. not the talent it's mm-hmm. the mind so it's crazy no for sure I think obviously like the saying goes in it talent's not enough like you gotta put that work rate and at the same time, I totally understand what you're saying, bro. Because even like doing this podcast, I weren't brought up on same way that you wasn't brought up on 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 media or anything like that. And for me, I was like, you know what? Let me test myself. Let me put myself out there a little bit more. Because even my missus, she says the same things where she's like, you know what? Just do it. Have these conversations because you've gone through what you've gone through, and it will help a lot of people. And at first, I was like. Nah, this ain't for me. And even even Instagram to this point where I just use it for like professional whatever for my work for my work stuff and things like that. But I totally understand what you're saying. You gotta you gotta take yourself out of your comfort zone. That's the only way you're gonna grow. Do you know what I mean? If you're if you're just doing the same things every day, like they say, it's a form of insanity. Do you know what I mean? If you're just doing the same things, you're just on a you're on a yeah, hamster wheel. Do you know what I mean? Existence. It's exactly, existence, bro. Exactly, exactly. So, but but one thing that I wanted to, to touch on as well was like, with everything that you was going through, how was you dealing with the pressures? Listen, you, you get you get good days, you get bad days. And I think for me, as I said, I, I don't know, I can only speak for myself. I, I, I felt like I excel when my back's against the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's crazy me saying that, but even when I was in, even like when I was in like the worst place, like I was down, the, like I'd done eight weeks down the block, nine weeks down the block. That's yeah. not normal. Like I had guys that proclaimed to be gangsters crying to go back up to the wing. Mm. And I was just like, you know, I was, I didn't see anybody. I was getting like a, 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 a phone call for 15 minutes probably a day or every two days to my missus and stuff and they were cutting the phone and you get a shower every two three days and yeah. like you're talking to people like, i'll be talking to you now but i'll never see you mm. so you start building up like a, a picture of how i remember talking to a, a scotsman and i thought he was like a a skinny white fella yeah. and then i managed to have a look peek through a little hole on the yard and it was this fat mixed race guy yeah. And it bugged me. Yeah. I swear to God, <laughs> it bugged. <laughs> but it bugged me. <laughs> it bugged me out. He's like this big, chunky. But his yeah. voice, because I couldn't see him. Because when yeah. you're down the block, it, it's, it's kind of like you don't get to see any. They keep everything yeah. separate. You got a radio. You got a radio where you can hear games, and then you got to put the aerial against the metal to get reception, and then they start messing about your battery. So you got to boil the kettle and put the yeah. batteries in to recharge it. Like when you've lived it, like my, and at that time, not at any point did I feel like my career was over. Okay. And I had like prison officers the same. Like, because the yard was probably like 20 by 30. It was really small. So it probably the size of my kids' bedrooms now. And we say, who are you training for? Like, your career is finished. And I would say things to them like, well, your career is finished because you're actually doing a bigger prison sentence than me. Like, I used to, that, that's how I used to play. Like, Why are you working out? I'm like, next time you're going to have the pleasure of seeing me will be on TV. I used to say, mm. I used to say, not to be arrogant, but I had to... T- to tell myself and convince myself mm. that's what the, the outcome was going to be, you know? Mm. So at my darkest points, I f- I f- at my darkest points, how can I say this? 
I felt sanity. Okay. It's crazy. It's cra because of where I came from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was what I was used to. So when my back was up against the wall, that's when I was excited. I had a point to prove. I've got a chip mm. on my shoulder. So mm. I'll say to these youngsters, like, without having to go through all of that mess, if you've got a, a, a manager or you've got somebody and they're looking to bring in someone new, don't look at it as a negative. You've got to be saying, mm. now, you know what? I'm going to show you mm. that I'm that guy. So whoever you're bringing in ain't taking my place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the mindset you've got to yeah. have. There's a company that are doing a certain thing. You're setting up a company, even if you're new, you can't look at that company and go, oh, well, they're doing that. And feel, oh, no, I can't do it because that person's doing it. You've got to be like, well, I'm happy what they're doing, but I'm going to exceed what they're doing. Mm. Mm. There's a different way of, of looking at things. And I'll say jealousy and envy is one of the biggest diseases of humanity. 100%. Okay. And you understand what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. even for me, when I, when I grew up in the estate, I saw drug dealers with M3. Yeah. I was like, I'm going to figure out a way to get one. It wasn't like, oh, look at these and then I'm going to sell drugs. I was like, okay, I'm going to figure out. I've had like, I can't, I've had about three or four of the M3. And mm. I've seen it. it I, I used it as a, as a positive narrative to say, okay, even if I see my brother or somebody else doing better than me, it was never a case of I was jealous or yeah. it deflated me. It, 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 it motivated me. I want to be a sponge, pick their brains. How do you get to that, that point? Or what is it that they're doing? And use it as a positive kind of aspect to, to, to benefit your situation. Mm. But everybody looks at success, it, it either scares them and, or they become insecure about it because of the other parts that are attached to it, which is mm. dedication, discipline, uh, uh, um, consistency, and taking yourself outside of your comfort zone. Yeah. That's what's attached, attached with success. And that's why a lot of people get to that point of being successful, but they fail because they they're not willing to, they get a nosebleed when they get to a point where it's like, oh no, no, I can't do that. Or yeah. no, that didn't work. So, and they start blaming the manager. Oh, he didn't pick me because he doesn't like me. I've heard that so many times. I'm like, if a manager don't pick me and he doesn't like me, I'm going to get to a point where I'm going to see that manager again and he's going to yeah. want to sign me. He's got no choice. So, yeah, it's, it's mm. you know, I had school teachers telling me I'm not going to be anything. And then, mm. I'll be like, right, one day. And then I'll tell you a funny story. Even when I was living at my auntie's in Nuned, in, in, by Peckham, right? I had a French teacher. Um, I'm not going to say her name. I'm not put in a, I hate the French. <laughs> yeah. I hate the French. And she was a black teacher as well. And she used to get on my, she used to get on my butt all the time. And I, I used to stop going to her lessons, I'll be honest. I just had my football in the rucksack. And that was about <laughs> it, maybe maybe a pencil and a ruler. Yeah, yeah. Um, and she used to get on, like I knew like her school reports were going to be the worst than it was. And she used to live next door to my auntie that I used to live with. And I remember seeing her at a bus stop and this is when I signed, I think I signed for, so I went to Watford 2004, 2005. Just got a bump, I, was, I think it was like 20 grand a week. And I bought myself a Bentley GC and I went to see my auntie because we're yeah. quite close. She's like my, my mum. And I saw her at the bus stop. And... Um... <laughs> <laughs> Go on, bro. Go on. <laughs> I saw her at the bus stop. No, I shouldn't say this because she really used to put me down. And I, I, yeah. I weren't the best of students but she used to tell me you're gonna be nothing blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. and I saw her at the bus stop and I pulled down and I wound up my window. there was no cars but I wound up my window I said how are you doing Mrs. Lou oh yeah. shit sure, <laughs> sure, anyway, no worries no worries I said how are you gonna do Mrs. Lou I said do you need a lift did <laughs> <laughs> the Bentley GT just come out yeah and yeah she fresh me and she turned her head I wound up my window and I pulled off and I just <laughs> made her head the, the, the exhaust pipe growl <laughs> <laughs> and it was you know like you tell these that, stories I tell yeah. my kids like don't let anybody do mm. not base your 
your life on anybody else's opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. opinions are like buttholes, man. Everybody's mm. got one, and a majority of them stink, man. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like you can't tap into somebody's mindset because it's not yours. Yeah. You've got to believe yours first before you start basing where you're going in life and what you can achieve mm. based on somebody else telling you what you can. You have to be like, no, this is what I can do. Yeah. And I will take advice sprinkled from success, failure. You know, you just create this, you see this recipe yeah, 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 yeah. that suits you. That's mm. what I told people. Do not, if someone says you're not going to be anything, well, that's their perception. Yeah. Doesn't, it shouldn't be your future mm. because of whatever they're feeling about where you can go. And, mm. you know, that's, that's always been my mindset, my outlook. Mm. Mm. Now, for sure. Do you know what? I, and I can definitely relate to that as well. I feel like a lot of people where we've come from as well is like, we've been told that you're not going to be good enough. Like we've like my family, we've come over as immigrants. Do you know what I mean? So I've seen my mom doing day shifts, night shifts. There'll be days where I won't see my mom or my dad for, for a couple of days cause they're just working. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, you get told all these things that you're not going to be good enough. Like I came to England. I didn't even speak a word of English, bro. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, all these things, people used to laugh at me and be like, Oh, this, like, obviously I didn't really understand what they're saying to me. But I could see that they're having a giggle and like kids, you know what I mean? They're, they're kids. I'm, yeah. I'm just going yeah. and saying, yes, yes. Like that's all I do. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, yeah. you, grow up, you got, you're basically starting from minus, not even from zero. You're starting from minus. Do you know what minus. I mean? So it's yeah. like, it's like we've been told that you're not good enough. So when you do well and you do see they miss lose and whatnot and, and they look at you and they're thinking, whoa, like he's done well. That's your fuel. Yeah. That's like, that's your buzz. That's like, and so when you get to a certain level and you're not getting that buzz from people just saying, oh, you're doing, you're doing well, you're doing well. But that's not, you're not used to that. You're not used to hearing people say yeah. you're doing well. You're used to say, hearing people say, you know, you're not good enough to come to this club. You're not good enough for this. And you're like, you know what? I'll show you. I'm going to show you that yeah. I am good enough. So when you're not getting yeah. that, you're seeking it. You're looking for it somewhere else. And you, 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 subconsciously start doing things that are seeking approval. Do you know what I'm saying? So you're seeking approval. Yeah. You're doing things out of character again because you're not that person no more. But you want you want that buzz again. So it's like it's it's hard, man. It's proper hard. And like again, yeah. this is another reason why I wanted to get you on. And when you said that you wanted to come on, like I was truly grateful because I know yeah, no this worries, is gonna man. be powerful man like especially for again for the people that where we well, anyone anyone not even just where we come from anyone. but just anyone so yeah it's powerful and, and one thing that again like i want to touch on now is the transition so you said from before like you knew in terms of money you, you was putting it in the right places you and the missus and things like that do you know what i mean now who gave you that mindset to put the money in the right places like was it was it someone that took that told you about this or you just kind of thought you know what this is not a long career for me like I want to make sure when I do finish I've got something mm. to fall on like where did that come from um I think it's a mixture because like my dad was always a grafter he was okay. always up like five o'clock in the morning it was always it was always a you know he's always on point always paid his bills and always kind of gave me that kind of bit the, the basic instructions life in terms of like handle handle your bills and make sure that you know things are kind of sorted out yeah. but then when I moved out at like 14 to my auntie's she was a she 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 works for the social services she was a child protection officer so mm. she was always at work and stuff so I was kind of like living on my own and then I got my own place at 16 so but from young I was doing things what gave me a buzz was to flip something yeah so I used to buy, I used to have, and you can ask anybody, all my mates, I used to have stacks of the newspaper. They used to come out in different colours every day. Yeah. And I was just ringing up. I'll go from the front to the back. And this is where I was going to school. Um, I used to ring off like little bargains. I knew the values of things. I'd ring off bargains. and I'd be like looking for some, something, ring it, get a bus there, buy it, re-advertise it, whether I had to clean it up or whatever. And I was doing this while I was in school. So I always had 
and there's other things that we can't touch on that I've yeah, done yeah. where I had to yeah. kind of make yeah. make way and do what I needed to do. So I always had that kind of hustle mentality in me, with or without football. Okay. I was always working. I was always close to the ground. So when people look at me, like even now, like people say, oh no, you know, he got in a lot of trouble. So yeah. where I am now is not in the script. Mm -hmm. So where I went on Instagram or whatever, people thought, oh, maybe he's gone away. And when they yeah. like reconnect, he's struggling. It's the total opposite. Like mm -hmm. I've always just made sure that I never put all my eggs in one basket. And as I said, it's called multiple sources of income, multiple streams of income. Mm -hmm. So I was always dabbling in this and that and properties. Like I remember, for instance, just got promoted with Watford to the Premier League, just signed a massive contract. Sign a big contract and say, Well, yeah, okay, look. Um, and I just achieved my dream of playing in the Premier League, just got promoted from Championship, we top we goal scoring Championship. Can we, can we get some figures, bro? Okay, like 40 grand a week, okay, and 20, like 25, 26. Okay, um, Watford ain't paid that money, yeah, ever, kind yeah, of thing. And yeah, I was yeah. kind of like the first player to and, kind and of. And sorry to yeah. cut you off, bro. The reason why I'm asking that, not not to be nosy, but yeah. for a lot of these players, again, that are earning this sort of money, even from the younger ages now, like, I want them to yeah. hear that there's been people that have been earning this type of money that have been putting it in the right place. And it's, yeah. it's important for them to understand this because there is young players, like I said, that are earning that, that type of money at the moment. And you see them getting jewellery, they're, they're going this, they're getting private jets, private jets add up. You know what I mean? So it's like you got to yeah. put your money yeah. in the right place, and that's the reason why I asked you if we can get some figures, yeah. just so people can understand yeah, yeah. that you can put yourself in the right yeah. place. Yeah, I mean, look, we were getting like five, six grand a point, mm -hmm. a point. So, and then a win bonus of maybe five, six grand. So you start, you get signing on fee, all sorts. So, for me, like more. When I signed, like, my first kind of decent contract, my wife goes, we're getting a five-year mortgage. Okay. So we we bought a house. It was, like, 1.6 million or something like that. Put in a five-year mortgage. I was paying £26,000 a month. Okay. And if you're clearing close to 100 grand a month, 26000 And it hurts doing it. I'm not going to yeah. be like, I'm not going to lie. You've got a slap down like 300 grand and then pay but then any like signing on fee I was getting or whatever or any bonuses I was slapping it I was waiting I, was, I finished that in two I, I finished that in two years mm. two three years three years Jules three yeah tell me about three years which has now put me in a stead so when I it put me in like the stead that I'm in now where I can now I, I got rid of my overheads early doors yeah yeah I didn't have a final, my financial advisor was me and my missus because okay. how we looked at it was financial advisors, not all are commission based. They're selling your product. And if it doesn't work out, the words, famous words are, we didn't predict that. Yeah. You sign the contract, you've lost a load of dough. And what I can say to these youngsters now is, like I said, to invest in yourself if you're signing, if you're getting that finance on a car, understand what APR is, mm -hmm. understand what final set, settlement figure is. Yeah. So if you're buying a car at sh a showroom and it's 20 grand and then you take it back um, and they're offering you eight grand, or you, you've just blown 12 grand. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, what, when you change it in, when you, when you, when you, 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 you swap it over, what are they going to give you against your car? What, what, what figure can they guarantee you? In? Mm -hmm. Is that worth it? I used to buy cars. So instance, for instance, sorry to go off subject. That's cool. I would buy like a, I remember buying an Audi R8 convertible for 65 grand in the winter. Mm -hmm. And why I bought in the winter? Because that was the cheapest time to buy a convertible. Kept it, to the summer, I used to take it out because it's four, four, like it's four wheel drive. Yeah. Take it out and on again. 
and sold it in the summer for 85 grand. So I was driving okay. it for pretty much nothing. Okay. Black and you made rims. it. And you made profit Everybody on top. Doing this. Yeah. Yeah, I was driving. Mm -hmm. So I would buy a car. I would go to Mercedes. I'd have like 15, 20% discount. Yeah. I would use that as my buffer system to drive that car for nothing. Okay. So when it was devalued, I was already 15 and 20% in front. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's how we, 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 our thought process was. Like if I got, I, even when I got promoted, I remember I got injured at Arsenal at the Emirates and I'd done my knee. I was out for a season. Mm -hmm. They were telling me I might not play football again. I didn't cry about it. I had some money in the bank. Me and my missus, this was 2007, 2008, repossession hit. Mm -hmm. We bought like three repossessions. Okay. It was that my, I sent my missus to auctions. Because you got to think, we're footballers that have a privileged lifestyle to say, you start training at 10, you finish by 12 o'clock, you're at home by one o'clock. Mm -hmm. You've got the rest of the day now to do your research. Get your missus on, on right move, Zoopla, find a property. Look at properties or land to so say like, your family's from maybe Nigeria, Ghana. Is there, a, is, can you get a flight out there? See what land you can buy. Is there a mine or something? We were okay. doing that while my career was doing well. Mm -hmm. It was close to the ground. So what my Achilles heel was, was, and where I fell out with managers, was I knew I didn't need football. Okay. And that was, it was a pro and a con for me because when I, when I got into, say, for instance, so we say Phil Brown, when he done that thing when he got us out on the pitch at Man City, we fell out. Like, he asked us in a meeting, like, what do you people think? And it was me and Georgie Botan, and it was like, Gaffer, that was bullshit. That was, sorry, I can't, don't yeah, fucking no, swear. Yeah. That, was, that, that was nonsense what you done. And then from that time, because at, at that point, he was linked with Sunderland, Newcastle, and that was where he's from. And, at Hull at that time was flying. I think yeah. it was like third. We beat Tottenham at Tottenham, Arsenal, Arsenal. Like, he was doing really well. So he was getting linked with other jobs. And then we came across Man City, who were in the transition of being the Man City they are. And they had Rubinio, they had Adibayo. They, like, mm -hmm. they ripped, they had company, they ripped us apart. Mm -hmm. And um, we were walking back into the dressing room. And he pulled us back out. No, 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 come over to the fans. He started clapping the fans, sat us down. I don't know if you've seen yeah, even yeah. like, yeah, yeah. Uh, even Bully, like he, yeah. he made the funny celebration of him taking a mick of yeah. us yeah. doing that celebration. He done. And sat us down and started hammering us in front of the fans. And we felt like at the time, if we win together, we win together, we lose together, we should have been in the change room yeah, sort of yeah. thing. It was at half time. And then he told me like, oh, X, Y, Z, started acting funny. And then I was scoring goals. I was top goal scorer at home. And then he wasn't playing me drew, drew, um, just based on me telling him my personal opinion. And I never knew, like my wife says to me, no, nah, babe, sometimes you, 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 you can't say that. And yeah. in my head, I'm like, well, if I say it, I've got nothing to lose anyway. Mm -hmm. But other people will be scared to say what I'm saying. I already knew I put, in the protocol and put in the foundations to make sure that if football was to ever end, mm -hmm. there's a life after football. Mm -hmm. It was a pro for me that I planned, but it was a con because I took risks that other people wouldn't take, mm -hmm. if that made sense, because yeah, yeah. I wasn't self-reliant on football. So it was kind of like an Achilles heel was... So I was always close to the ground, man. We, we've always been switched on to know that football's got a small window and that it's not going to last forever. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of, no matter what you do in life, take yourself outside of your comfort zone, have mm -hmm. a look at something else, do a bit of research, whether you do podcasts, whether you, you're a fireman, whether you're, you know, doesn't matter what you are. Mm -hmm. Investigate, you know, be a sponge to, because what we get stuck in this lane is, oh, this is all we can do. And that's mm. why you would find a lot of football players either end up bankrupt or depressed yeah. because they haven't taken themselves outside of what they believe that's all they can do. So when it's taken away from them, they're struggling. Yeah, yeah. And 
my advice to anybody in any walks of life, don't believe or don't just channel yourself to one speciality. Mm. This can take you anywhere you want to go and make you be anything you want to be at any given time, at any given age. Mm. And people need to understand that. That's powerful again, man. I want to touch on like the transition again of you leaving UK or London, whatever you want to call it, to where you are now, to what you're doing. Like, how was that transition for you? And what, what made you move out there as well? Um, yeah, I mean, look, I'm, I, I live in Zambia now and I think it was a, it was a, a mixture of things. Obviously, my wife is Zambian. She was born here. Okay. And when I was, yeah, when I was playing, playing, when I had my playing career, my, my wife always used to harp on me about um, Zambia and opportunities and stuff like from early. And yeah. I think 2012, I got a fly out here and we started looking at different kind of, and this is as early as 2012, 2000, I think 2011, we started looking at different kind of business ventures outside of the UK. And then we just saw kind of like what way UK was, was going in terms mm -hmm. of like knife and gun crime and all of those things. So we kind of took it upon ourselves to say, let's look at the lifestyle somewhere else. We looked at different op options. We looked at Dubai. Yeah. Um, different places to live because we wanted the sunshine. We wanted the kind of different kind of life. Yeah, yeah. In terms of what was instilled in us. Yeah, you? your normality. Yeah, just mm. being in existence. I didn't want to do the nine to five. I didn't want to be, uh, uh, to, I didn't want to work for anybody. And yeah. we kind of had the same kind of goals and aspirations. And then, we made the transition in 2014, set up our own um, construction company. We, we, we started our own business. We've always had properties all over the place. So that, that was kind of taking care of itself. But in terms yeah. of us, what we're doing now, we're just, we're just entrepreneurs. We're just bosses, man. We, we, we kind of work for ourselves. We don't answer to anybody. And that's what we instill into, uh, in, 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 into our kids, mm. you know, don't work so hard to fulfill somebody else's dream when you can actually create your own kind of entity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's that, again, you know? you're just, yeah, you're dropping gems right now, bro. And, and I totally agree with you, but like, even for yourself, how was that transition for you though? Like coming from the UK or London and, and like South, South London, like how was that transition for you going to a, a country like Zambia where, a lot of a lot of people as well look at you know like Africa as a continent and they look at it and think there's nothing going on there. It's what the media has portrayed and there's even even things like the Middle East where people will hear things about Middle East and say you know it's a dangerous place. But bro, I can leave my door downstairs open and no one's gonna come in. Do you know what I mean? So it's like yep. what we've been fed again and like you said, your mind's got to expand and it's got to be. Uh, open to a lot of things but again a lot of people don't see outside of whatever Hackney London or whatever they're, that's that's their bubble they're, they're stuck in that but in terms of you like what what difficulties did you go through when you was when you first arrived there um I'd say obviously the language barrier okay but then again my wife, my wife speaks fluent Bemba mm -hmm. um which made it easier. And then her parents shifted over to here, back over here. I mean, they wanted a different lifestyle for themselves because mm. they were getting um, older in the sunshine. I mean, the weather's out, the weather out here is beautiful. Mm. Um, it was slower. Yeah. So if I can put it that way, obviously coming from the UK, it's hundred miles an hour. Yeah. There's no getting away with it. If you, especially if you, and to be fair, like when we lived in England, like majority of my career, I didn't live in London. I kind of lived in the countryside because okay. I found London to just be a little bit too hectic for me. And it used to draw me into to too many situations. But um, this is what I'm, I'm going to come back to again, bro. I'm going to say like, this is until you step outside of your comfort zone. And this is what I had to learn to do. You won't know what's on the other side. Yeah. You just won't know it. 
I remember even when I moved from Peckham to Bromley, certain of my family members thought I lived in the countryside. Yeah. 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 But this is, you know, when you've got the 36 bus and a 12 bus that does a certain route, you become accustomed to what you believe is the world. Mm. But the world is m much bigger than that. Yeah. Coming here was slower, but I just had to adjust it. Over time, you adjust. It's like mm. going to a new school. You have that fear factor. Oh, my God, I'm going to a new school. First day, people are not too keen on you. Second day, oh, I don't like it. Third day, you start easing. It's like anything yeah. in life. You've got to take that risk. Mm. The bigger the risk, the bigger the reward. Mm. And I don't regret, and this, this is how crazy it is, and I'm sure you would agree with me. When I first moved, there was even like jokes and, oh, where are you? Is there internet? Yeah. Do you think you're lying? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Then you start, you start realizing that people are not actually, um, they're not like, what's the word? They're not, uh, 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 um, they're, they're, they're uneducated. They're not like, yeah. it's not like they don't want to do it. It's just that they don't know how to do it or mm -hmm. they're not really thought about it. But guess what? As time's gone on, they see how I live. Yeah. Know? Everybody's trying to shift. Mm -hmm. For sure. Everybody's, every, and all it is, is we've, me and you have done things earlier than other people yeah, because yeah, they yeah. allow their mindset to keep them in that box. Mm -hmm. But everybody is, if they could, they would do exactly what they're doing because now they realize that the world is bigger than where they're from. Mm -hmm. And it's just whether you can just switch on to certain things earlier than others. But I'm mm -hmm. telling you now, like when my family members come out here, they don't want to go back to England. Bro, I've, I've seen yet, what England, you posted up, bro. It's, I wouldn't want to go back of... to London either. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's... it's, it's it's a different world and it's, I don't know, man, it's, 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 it, it, it's weird because when you're, you're, when people train your mind or your mind is trained to be a certain way, it's mm. very hard to step outside of your box. And that's what we got. This is why I say you have to invest in this before you can do or achieve anything. And if you can't mm. do this and you're waiting for somebody else to, to coach you, or you're yeah. waiting for anybody, somebody else to go, oh, let's go running to lose weight. No, if you want to lose weight, lose weight yourself. Mm. Starts with you first. Because mm. if I'm not around, or if you're not around, then what happens? And you're just going to put weight back on. Yeah. It yeah. has to start here first. You've got mm. to want to do it. Yeah, yeah, know? yeah, for sure. What, what inspires you, bro? To be, to be the best version of yourself? I think um, my wife, my kids, and growth, man, growth. I'd say I'm learning every day, man. I'm still yeah. learning about myself. I still, I still find myself going back into the old me sometimes, and my, my wife has to kick my ass and say, mm. "No, nah, snap out of it." Yeah, it's yeah. growth, man. I'm 40, I'm forty, and I'm still learning so much more about myself mm. because I'm opening up more. When I was mm. younger. I had this I'm all right lad ego because I was designed that way. I didn't know how to, well, you know, you like people mention counseling. What well, I'm yeah, not yeah. mad. That, you see, like where we're from, yeah. the word counseling or mental health was associated with people that yeah. were mad. Yeah, so you're going we, mad. We wouldn't attack ourselves to it. Mm. Yeah, we're going mad. Like, what? Health? Yeah. I'm not men. I ain't got. You start after you start realizing like the only thing perfect in life is imperfection, man. We all got demons. Yeah. And until we approach the situation head on, we can't improve as people. Mm. So, you know, I'm still, and I'll be honest, I'm still fighting demons, man. I'm like old demon, like scars, like there's still scars yeah. that ain't healed that I'm working on slowly. So it's all right to be different. It's all right not to feel a uh, hundred percent. Mm. Speak about it. Open up about it. Uh, 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 um, talk to people about it. It doesn't make you any weaker. It actually makes mm. you stronger. Yeah, hundred. You understand what I'm saying? So, mm. 
it's, it's a process. Things and then just seeing it. It's yeah, a it's process, a process, bro. It's a process, man. Like, you know what I'm saying? If I feel like once you're open to the idea of speaking about your truth, I feel that's, that's the moment that you're going to expand even more and, and grow as a person. So like you're saying, even till now, even till, you know, hopefully and everything, we, we, we grow old and, and wise and whatnot. You're still going to learn when you're, when you're 50. Do you know what I mean? You're still going to learn what you was doing at 40. Yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? So it's, it's all part of the process. Yeah, yeah. But do you, feel, do you feel like you're ever misunderstood, bro, from people? Yeah, all the time. Yeah. All the time, especially my wife. Because <laughs> yeah. she knows me the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She knows me the best, but she don't know me the best, if that yeah, makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah, it makes total we, sense. We, sometimes we, we, we go at it. This is the craziest thing. We go at it. We've actually got the same point of view. Yeah. But it's how we express ourselves. Oh, bro. <laughs> so... Yeah, yeah, I know what you're saying. We're saying the same so we thing. Go at it, like yeah, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on, no, go on, go on, go on. I'll let you talk, go on. But she'll she'll say it's my delivery. My delivery oh, is, like you're yeah. too loud. Like yeah, yeah. You're too loud. You can't because she'll say to me, um you, you, you're too loud, even though you're right. Yeah. What you're saying sounds wrong because you're too loud. I'm like, well, I'm passionate about what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to be yeah. calm and collective. Yeah. But we're yeah. saying the same thing. We have thing. an argument about the same, same thing, thing that we're saying. It's crazy. But that's Mad. what keeps us together, man. That's the bond. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. No, nah, for sure, man. That's beautiful. <laughs> Bro, that's beautiful though, man. I feel like again, just hearing that 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 sort of dynamic it just yeah. It it resonates so much between me and my missus as well. But that's the beauty of it. And it's like you need someone like that in your corner as well, just to keep you going, man. Do you know what I mean? That's the beauty of it. So, yeah, nice, nah, powerful, yeah, man. Do. But um, got a buzz off each other. Exactly, exactly, man. I know, I know, you're not a man of regrets. I know that. Um, especially again, like I'll keep repeating it, but where we've come from, you can't regret anything where you are now. Do you know what I mean? But if there's anything that you would turn back or do something different, is there anything that you would do different? Looking back at it now. What would I do? Um, I think uh, uh, going back and saying if I could do anything different, I would. I needed to listen more. Okay. I think a lot of a lot of my errors and a lot of my mistakes came from not having the uh, ability to listen and I'm not just talking about somebody saying no don't do this don't do that but even when somebody's talking to me yeah I'd, I'm thinking about what I want to say instead of digesting what they're saying mm -hmm. so you got an answer already. that could have yeah yeah so it's kind of like you're talking you're talking you're talking and I'm switching off because I'm preparing, I've heard the first few sentences yeah. and I'm preparing what I'm going to say. So I'm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I'd, I'd say, and I think that that could have been a massive kind of um, pro for me. But regrets, I can't, I can't regret anything because if I regret something, that hurts my future in terms yeah. of my mindset going through. I, as I said, I always never look at it as a loss, always a lesson. So mm. even if it was a dark space, the worst period of my life, now I have the education and the knowledge to say, or to give that to somebody else and say, well, you know, like our kids can't say, well, dad, you've never been through this. Or, yeah. I'm going to say, well, yeah, well, actually I did. And this is what I should have done. So, and if you want to do and follow your own route and do that, this is exactly what's going to happen. You're going to end up in jail. You're going to end up with this. Mm -hmm. You're going to end up. So how do, how does my kids get at me and say, Oh, or say to their mum, well, you don't know what it's like to live. Yeah, well, we actually I, I do. do. So, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so that's how we flip that narrative. We regrets don't really come into my vocabulary in terms of, or my wordplay. Yeah. Because regrets are for people that want to feel sorry for themselves. Mm hmm. Bro, That's powerful again, man. Nah, powerful, 100%. Yeah. I agree with you. Do you know what? 
I said to you I was going to be about half an hour, 45 minutes. This is the longest I've ever done a podcast and I can go on and on and on. I feel and like on. I'm just talking to a mate. I just feel like I'm talking to one of my boys. I, 100%. I what we was even on. 100%. Is and that's, and that's, I said, like, when you sent me the questions, I was like, yeah. I'm not even reading them because we're just going to go off radar and just, yeah, yeah. just be real. That's what I feel anyway, so. No, 100%. Do you know what? Again, I sat down. I said, you know, I'm not writing no questions for Marlon. I'm just going to go off the cuff. I wrote some and I sent it to you. But I was like, you know what? I'm li- I ain't even been looking at them. I just thought, you know, let me just talk to you about it. Like, just normal conversation. And again, this, is, yeah. this has been powerful, the best bro. Interviews, bro. The best, the 100% and the best. And that's, that's the whole point of this show again. It's like, it's about having that genuine conversation with people like yourself that, are open as well because like you said there's a lot of players that or or whoever people in the football industry that keep things closed and they don't expose things or just be open about certain situations so again i appreciate him but before we wrap it up yeah i'm gonna ask you a quick fire round question yeah because we didn't spoke about football too much i want to i want to touch on some some of the football quickly yeah best player you've played with Best player? Yeah, that um, you played with. For assists and goals, I'm going to say my boy Ashley Young. Okay. All right. Mm. All right. As a, that's, a, that's a real strike. Just because of what he... What, yeah, because what, what he done for me in terms of, like, just somebody knowing where you are, how you are, you buzz off them on the pitch, off the pitch, your roommate, mm. teammate, like, you know, like, that kind of vibe, I'd say the whole package. I'll say Ashley Young. Yeah. Did you think he was ever going to go to the to the heights that he's that he's obviously achieved? Even till now, he's still playing for one of, one of the biggest clubs in the world. Um, I, I'll be honest with you. I told this story all the time. Like when I got to Watford, he was in the change room as a trialist. Okay. Because they released him and said, "Oh, well, you live local in Stevenage. Just come back down and train because we, you know, we could just see how you get on." And then me and him clicked, and then he ain't looked back, and he's. He's gone on to have a, an amazing career, man. I even mm. tell him all the time how proud I am of him. Of him that even at 35, playing for him Milan in yeah. European Cup finals and stuff. No, he smashed it. No, oh, powerful, man. He definitely has. Um, toughest opponent you've come up against? Toughest? Yeah. Most horrible, I'd say, and I've come up with uh, quite a few. I can say Tony Adams, Sol Campbell, Rio Ferdinand, but the worst, worst player I didn't like was um, Vidic. He, he, he's he's um yeah really dirty. The ball was nowhere <laughs> near you. Um, your goalkeeper had the ball and he's punching your yeah. ribs and yeah that guy was a real. He should have been in. I don't know if you remember the film Universal Soldier. Yeah yeah with yeah. Dolph yeah. Lundgren yeah, and yeah. Van Dam. Yeah he should yeah, they yeah. should have put him. Yeah they should have put him as one of those the army guys with the yeah with the with a mic. Yeah yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it was yeah it was that sort of. <laughs> But but you see you see those you see like again, this is something that young players don't really think about is like when you get to that level, it's those little margins that will get you ahead. Do you know what I mean? It's like yeah, yeah. What again for strikers, especially for strikers, what 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 advice would you give for for young strikers coming through in the game? Um, in terms of working in your game, repetition, um, repetition, um, annoy your manager, stay out, do shooting practice because. What, one thing I used to do that I used to like doing is like some shooting drills on the Friday before the game on the Saturday because okay. you, it, you carry that momentum into and when you go to bed, you, your last kind of thought process is on, on what your last session was. So mm-hmm. even if your, 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 your manager does pattern of play or 11 v 11, get a little squeeze, get get onto their assistant manager said, look, I just need to give me 10 shots at a goal because you will carry that kind of momentum into a game. You you you, you play how you train. Mm-hmm. And you cannot, very rare can you switch it off and switch it back on. It has mm-hmm. to be right throughout training, man. And more times when you're on fire and training, you will carry that into a, 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 a mm-hmm. live game. So, mm-hmm. And also, I'd say for any player, um, think for kickoff. Think about your first touch. Mm. Think about your first touch. Everything will follow afterwards. Your mm. skills, your stepovers, 
your shot from long range, you have to build that confidence. Mm. So there's a foundation. From kickoff, make sure if you're the striker that's playing it to the left, make sure it gets to that destination. Make sure that when the ball comes into you, you hold up play. Don't try and flick it around the defender. You do that for our, our old. Our mm. Wait, one second, bro. Let me just put this laptop on charge, yeah? Give me two seconds. Because it's just cutting up a little bit. Can you hear me? You're, you're okay. Yeah, I'm still with you. Yeah, quality. Cool yeah. So I thought, oh, is he falling asleep on me? Nah. <laughs> no, 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 no. Because it kind of froze, it was like this. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what? It's coming up to one here as well. No, 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 <laughs> not at all. Just last two, last two. I won't take nuts. too much of your time, man. <laughs> yeah, no worries, bro. Um, best manager you've played for? Uh, I'd say A.D. Bufroyd. Um, obviously, it's the current um, England under 21s manager right now. But in terms of getting the best out of me and understanding um, understanding uh, man management, that was one of the biggest things. Um, you know, all managers are different. Like Chrissy Uton, attention to detail. Um, Steve Bruce for, for, for training in terms of like 5v5s. He just knew how to like, like all different managers are different, but in terms of like getting the best out of me, understanding who I am as a person, Adrian Bufford. Okay, okay. Last one, man. Favorite favorite moment in football? Well, yeah, I've got to say, I've got to say the playoffs because that season was long and we were the underdogs. It was kind of like we were. I think we were tipped to go down Watford because all the players would like Heide Helgerson left and all the players left and AD came in and he was bringing in players that were either on the verge or kind of not getting on at their clubs mm. and we, the way we did it and the way we just smoked everyone we smoked Palace in the playoffs and then we went and smoked Leeds and Leeds brought bag of fans like loads of fans mm. and um Obviously, me just leaving Leeds on loan. A.D. Boothroyd was like assistant coach there. So he left Leeds. There was a couple of players. Matty Spring just left Leeds. I think Darius Henderson was released by Leeds. Um, Clark Carlisle left Leeds with me. So there was like a little history there. And they were kind of like the biggest club in the championship at that time. Yeah. Um, and we just, smoked, we just smoked them. But then again, I would say Gillingham, when we played... Arsenal, the, the old hybrid. Okay. My club, my boy Hall club. Yeah. I've just come into the championship, played him in FA Cup, and I managed to score against like Seaman and play against mm. Tony Adams and Vieira. So there's there's quite a few, but those are the two kind of stand up moments for different reasons. Okay, okay, bro. Listen, man, I feel like I can talk to you all day. You know, like when you when you said to me, yeah, this time I was thinking. Man, it's eleven o'clock here. You know, I think I might have to tell him we're gonna reschedule it. You know, but I said like yeah. again, it's the mindset. I said, nah, I'm doing it. Don't matter if it's eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock, because I knew this yeah. was gonna be powerful, man. And again, no, bro, I really man. appreciate yeah. it, man. Like taking your time Anytime. out. And again, like I said, this has been the longest I've ever even sat down and spoke to someone on a podcast. So it's like again, it's like just yeah. chatting to your yeah. boys and bro. Yeah, yeah, again, yeah, if is if is there anything we didn't cover? Um, not really. No, listen, I, listen, if there's a part two, there's a part two, man. I've, 100%. I've got stories all day long, man. All day long. Anytime you want to tap in, I'm here, man. I mean, look, as I said, it's, I don't feel like I'm talking to a podcast. I just feel yeah. like I'm talking to one of my boys, just reasoning and just mm -hmm. hashing it out. So, and these are the best interviews for me. I like, I tell a lot of these guys that, that want to be sending me like, like formulated kind of questions and scripts. I'm not, yeah. I'm no filter, I'm no filter, man. That like you get the realist at me when you just were off the cuff and you're just yeah, yeah. being honest and real. When when I feel like people are robots, I, 
kind of, I, I'm yeah. out of my comfort zone. I don't really yeah. like that. I just like to just. I ain't got nothing to lose. It's not like I'm gonna like piss off my boss. I don't have yeah, one yeah. apart from my yeah. myth. So <laughs> um, that's the important one, bro. You can't do that. Yeah, you can't just, can't piss them off. Yeah, like, oh, you gotta go to bed because you gotta be at work at eight. I'll go to work when I want. So <laughs> no, I love that, man. Love that. Do you know what? Yeah. Do you know where part two is gonna be? It's gonna be out there, bro. I'm gonna come out there. We'll do part yeah. two out there. Hundred percent. No problem, and, man. And chop it up. Hundred yeah, no percent, man. Bro. Again, love, much love. Um, I wish you all the best. Again, everyone that's listened, that's tuned in, I hope you took a lot of stuff from this because uh, Marlon just dropped so much stuff here. Um, but yeah, bro, 100% love. Um, take care yeah, of yourself love, and keep safe. Yeah, and we'll we'll definitely touch base. Love to the family, the message, man. Yeah, 100%, 100%, bro. Cheers, much man. love, man. <laughs>